always such an exciting experience to be here with the warriors of AAPS and the physicians who are fighting for the survival of our profession. We know that independent doctors are targeted by extinction. You can read the reformers. Tell us about that explicitly in the New England Journal of Medicine and other places, and they are certainly acting as though they really do mean it. They have another weapon against us now. I brought along the latest issue of AAPS News that you may see that asks the questions, do doctors have an expiration date or do doctors expire in 10 years? That's the new tactic of maintenance of certification to make us all eternal students and serfs of these lucrative cottage industries making money from our work. Dr. Chrisman will say a little bit about that at the very end. Unfortunately, lawyers do not expire. Neither do most politicians and or laws. And maybe we can do something about that. I'd like to call your attention to a book that I'm now reading by Malcolm Gladwell. You may be familiar with his book, The Tipping Point, which was also very good and pertinent. The latest one is David and Goliath, from which we can learn a lot. Some of the take-home lessons are that things are not always what they seem, that way may, what appears to be an advantage may not be an advantage, may be a disadvantage, and what appears to be a disadvantage may actually be a strength. Just keep in mind the historical situation. We had Goliath, a seemingly invulnerable giant, heavily armored with three, no fewer than three deadly weapons, confronting David, a shepherd who was really at the lowest scale of, of esteem in those days. But what was really going on? Goliath was big, huge, maybe the biggest giant of all times, clumsy, immobile. He had double vision. His vision as a whole was very poor. He almost certainly had acromegaly with a vulnerable spot right in the middle of his forehead. David was no sweet little shepherd boy. David was a warrior who is highly skilled in the use of the artillery of his day, namely a sling that he had already used to kill a bear and a lion that were attacking his sheep. So we know, we know what happened. The other important point was that David was on the right side. Goliath was a Philistine, and supposedly that ethnic group was wiped off the face of the earth, but I think they're back. How about United Health, Aetna, CMS, and a lot of other people that you could probably name. But David was on the right side, and we need to be on the right side, and we need to have a solid foundation in ethics that AAPS has always stood for. And I think many of us have been confronted with the questions, are you as an independent physician really doing the ethical thing? Or are you turning your back on these poor Medicare beneficiaries, and you're just really being just a greedy, selfish doctor. Well, I think we should ask ourselves this question about like with Medicare, for example. Could we be potentially enabling a criminal enterprise in, in cooperating with some of these Philistines? After all, when we see a Medicare patient, who is really paying us? Maybe it's the invisible man, we talked about at the time of Franklin Roosevelt. Some of the invisible men that I know of are named Larry, Fred, and Jesus. They work at Arnold Mendez's gas station in Tucson, where I buy all my gasoline if I possibly can. Arnold Mendez escaped from Cuba, and he has a lot of choice things to say about Obamacare and about the direction our country is heading. Larry and Fred are kind of older guys who are still having to toil away at the gas station. Jesus is a young man who has a wife and children, and who works 14-hour shifts. So, and it's guys like them from which all the money that goes to pay Medicare doctors is taken. So should I have some qualms about taking money from them to pay my fees for Medicare? I've never turned down a Medicare patient, but when I disenrolled back in the 1990s, some of my patients left me. They abandoned me. I did not abandon them. 
Many of them can afford to pay me. And those who can't, I don't need to take money from Jesus to help pay my fees. What about the oath of Hippocrates? I had the, uh, participated in a, a graduation ceremony recently for a medical student class, and they administered a Hippocratic oath. It was done with great emotion, and it sounded very noble, high-sounding, lofty expression, but I had to call up the head of the program afterward and say, you know what? That was not the oath of Hippocrates. That was the oath of lasagna, Louis Lasagna from Columbia University, unfortunately my alma mater. And it has some sentiments in it that kind of are similar to the oath of Hippocrates, but they're really not quite the same. And one of the things they say in there is that if it is given to me to end a life, I will do it with humbleness. You know, that's kind of a, kind of a big difference. Um, and the oath of lasagna leaves open that you will be serving population health, if necessary, by sacrificing the individuals like these Medicare patients that we really can't afford to pay for anymore. The Independent Payment Advisor Commission and Managed Care in general has it all set up so that the death panel is going to be you. It's going to be you if you're not the patient's doctor, but if you're working for the benefit of, of population health. After all, how can you optimize population health if the patient is old and decrepit and has no chance of ever getting any better. So that there are ways of taking care of patients who need our health. One of them is called charity. Is charity demeaning, whereas theft from the younger generation is not? I didn't much like it when George Bush was talking about compassionate conservatism. I think he was really wrong on a lot of his premises there. But there is no such thing as compassionate socialism. Karl Marx taught people you've got to teach the children to hate. Because socialism, after all, is a zero-sum game. It redistributes by taking from some to give to others. Charity, on the other hand, is voluntary, as Portia said in The Merchant of, Benefit, uh, Merchant of Venice, that uh, the quality of mercy is not strained. It blesses him that gives, as well as him that takes. And I think Dr. Eck, one of our speakers, will, has illustrates that so beautifully in, his, in her Seraphith Clinic. So we're here to fight for the tradition of medicine. We fight on the right side. We keep our ethics grounded in what is right. We know that our profession of medicine cannot ethically be a servant of a state, but only of our patients. And we have weapons. We have powerful weapons. We have the weapons of truth. One of them, I think one of the most powerful ones that's been deployed by uh, George Keith Smith of the Surgery Center of Oklahoma. I call him our St. George the Dragon Slayer has aimed one piece of artillery right square in the head of all of these managed care bad guys by doing the simple thing of publishing prices. He didn't wait for Congress to do it. He didn't wait for lawyers to do it. He just did it. And that's what a lot of people in this room are doing. We're showing the right, the right way. And I think that we will prevail if we stay true to our principles.